Welcome to Fit Body Lifestyle, the show where we dive deep into the world of fitness, health, business, relationships, and the art of living a balanced life. I'm Jamie. And I'm Greg, and we're here to give you the benefit of our experiences in the fitness and bodybuilding industry, the corporate world, running a business, personal development, and building healthy relationships. Whether you're sweating it out in the gym, hustling in your business, or seeking balance in your everyday life, you're in the right place. So lace up those sneakers and grab that water bottle and let's get ready to transform our minds, our bodies, and our lives. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Fit Body Lifestyle. I'm here with Papa Bear, Greg D. Bernard, and we're going to talk today about biofeedback and check-in considerations. So these are the things you want to be thinking about when you're doing your check-ins, whether it's with yourself or your coach each week. And I, I'm going to expand our topic just a just a smidgen, and I'm going to. We did di- not discuss this prior. <laughs> I know I'm very spontaneous, which Jamie loves sometimes, and sometimes she doesn't, which is okay. Um, but the the feedback that we're talking about for an athlete check in is how you communicate with your coach, what what happened during your week or your day or whatever period. Of or time yourself, you're if you're coaching yourself, right. yes. And and the other the expansion I want to make of this is that look. Um, If you're working a job and you have a boss or you are a boss, um, being able to set up for a feedback session with your boss, being able to set up with a feedback session for your supervisor um, or you're the one receiving that feedback, these are these principles apply to that as well. So um, and and, and that's the expansion I want to get is that that when we talk about this, some of it definitely is specific to this world of competing, but some of it also applies in terms of the preparation, in terms of the candor, the vulnerability, that piece definitely does apply when you're in a feedback session in a professional, in a, in a work situation as well. So um, that, that's all I wanted to do. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. And um, and it, it certainly applies to fitness goals too. It doesn't necessarily, Correct. a lot of these things you'll want to consider, you know, especially towards your fitness goal, even if you're not planning on getting on stage. So, um, you know, I'm just going to just dive into kind yeah. of like the nuts and bolts to start with. So um, number one, uh, you know, especially if you're competing, the most important thing is what do you look like? So the reason I want to bring this up, and, and you know, I'm sure that many of you are taking check-in photos and, you know, posing videos and, the, you know, and those types of things. But what I wanted to bring up specifically is make sure that your photos are in good light and that they're clear. Ideally, you want to take them in the same place if you can. I know it's not always possible, but if you can, in the same uh, suit, you know, so if you've got a posing suit or something like that, you know, you, you know, ideally you want it to be as close to what you're going to wear on stage if you're a competitor. If you're, if it's a fitness goal, then of course, you know, just whatever you feel comfortable um, with doing it. But the consistency is going to help you better evaluate the changes from one week to the next. So this is one of the big issues I see with clients is, you know, they'll send me photos. Maybe they're too far away from the camera. Mm-hmm. So in order for me to be able to see them, I've got to expand it so much that it gets pixelated and it's not as high quality. It's harder for me to tell. So like Phil up the entire frame of the picture or they're not lit well enough. Um, One of the things I know a lot of people love in the bodybuilding industry is the anabolic lighting that's in a lot of posing rooms at the gym. And while it makes you look amazing, it's not really giving your coach a really good view of what they're working with. And stop stop right there. Just let's define anabolic lighting. Okay, so that would be more down lighting. It's going to create shadows. So, for example, you know, in bikini, one of the important aspects we're looking at is do we see the tie-in? So that's the line around the glute at the bottom, you know, where it ties into the hamstring. Um, and so if we've got that down lighting, it's going to create a shadow and give you the illusion that there's more of a separation there than there might be in actual real life. Right. And 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 again, it, I guess the, the bottom line on this is as much – What's the word I'm looking for? Consistency as you can apply to that check-in photo. Same outfit, same of time of day, same conditions, fasted. Um, the the more you can replicate those conditions, that is the easiest way to then measure devi- deviations from that from that baseline. Right. If if you're taking one picture at 7 a.m. and another picture at 12 p.m., um, th- there's five hours difference between those two, and so there's going to be differences in your body. So. Again, the consistency aspect in, in terms of taking those check-in pictures, and I, I'm with you, I hate it when feet are cut off. And the reason I hate it when feet are cut off is because 
Oftentimes, the pose that you're hitting in a check-in photo can be modified by adjusting the foot position, but if we can't see the feet, then we can't tell you, oh, point your toe this way or that way, or it's just, it's very difficult to manipulate the pose to determine, hey, look, you may look better than what you think. It's just the posing around it that that we can't adjust in those weekly check-in photos. But but the primary thing is really just the, the basic tip of the bottom of the feet to top of the head. Yes. And I like what you mentioned in terms of the different times of the day. I mean, we do have athletes that have swing shifts and things like that. And what I would suggest if you're one of those people is to, you know, ask your coach for a day that you know you're going to be able to be the most consistent as possible. Um, I do have a couple of athletes that I have kind of a flex date check-in because it's, you know, their, their, their work weeks vary so much from one to the other. So, you know, whereas that person might be programmed in for a Thursday check-in, if based on their work schedule, they're going to be able to get a full night's sleep and give me a more consistent check-in on Wednesday, I'd rather them send it to me Wednesday than send it on Thursday and we might not have an accurate representation of the progress from the prior week. So that's one of those things where just communicate with your coach, because if they don't know that, you know, Wednesday check-ins don't work well for you because sometimes you're up at six and sometimes you're up at four or, you know, then, then let them know and, you know, hopefully they can accommodate you. So what's your view on the outliers, meaning an athlete who, um, normally checks in at seven, eight with 7am pictures every, every time, but for whatever reason they're traveling or whatever, and it's no longer 7am, it's a different time. And, and so, so what's your, what's your thought? Yeah. I mean, we do our best to work around it. You know, maybe they send their check in a day before, before they head out to their trip, but maybe that doesn't work. So you, you got to just do the best you can and, and, and get as consistent as you can. It's not going to be perfect. I mean, a good example is peak week, you know, so in peak week, we're checking people in every single day. So it's very hard to replicate for certain people depending depending on like what their work week is looking like again. So, you know, I, I take that into account. So if I have somebody who's going to send me a check-in and I know they're getting up two, three hours earlier than they typically do, maybe it's a flight to the show. I mean, it could be a, a lot of different things. I'm going to take that into consideration when I'm deciding what to do next, because, you know, just, just, so you know, if you get less sleep, you're going to weigh more, you may hold a little bit of water. So we just want to take all of those things into consideration. Right. And, and that was really the purpose I asked that question is just to recognize that there is no perfect on this. There is optimal. And so when we describe optimal, optimal is as consistent as you can. But then there's this other part, which is accommodative, um, meaning that you have got to do the best you can. Um, and, and, and if it means taking your pictures later or whatever, just provide the context around the pictures. You don't need to apologize for it. I, I mean, there are some athletes that we have that stress out about the check-in photos, just stress out. Oh, I couldn't do it with this. It's like, look, you did what you did and that's fine. It, we're, we're good with that. Just tell me the context of, of when you took this picture. Hey, um, I, I was not fasted. It was in different light. I was, you know, wh- whatever the circumstances so that at least we can take that in. And, and I, if there was an overriding theme in the check-in that we're going to get to uh, through all of this, it's the more context we have with the check-in, the better your check-in will be. 100%. And, and that also applies as I made that uh, that connection to the corporate world as well and performance reviews. Context is everything. So a, a, no situation happens without some type of context on it. And the more context that you can provide, the more understanding there is about where we go from there. So let's go ahead and jump into the next point, which is going to be body stats. So we talked about pictures. Next step is body stats. So, you know, I know we've talked a lot on prior episodes about weight. Weight is a data point. Um, We do want first thing in the morning. So we're going to get up, usually go to the bathroom. Um, You know, most people will urinate. Not everybody will, you know. Do number two um, before, <laughs> you know, poo. that's we okay. And I, well, I, I say that just because I know sometimes people freak out, oh my God, I haven't had a bowel movement yet. It's okay. You know, not, you know, a lot of us don't very first thing in the morning. That's okay. Um, so get up, go to the restroom, hop on the scale. Um, at that point, you want to take your circumference measurements. And I mean, each coach might be a little bit different. We typically track waist, hip, and thigh um, because we have primarily female competitors and that those are the areas we're usually looking to either expand or, or contract. Um, so um, the, the key there is, again, consistency. So um, when you're doing, you know, the scale, step on the same scale every day. Um, if you have any doubts as to whether or not your scale is accurate, I tell people, you know, if you have like a small dumbbell or something, you know the exact weight of, you can test it out that way. Um, you know, but using the same scale is, is really a good idea. If you're going to travel, Um, A suggestion I have is you can get a travel scale. They have some really small ones. They weigh like a pound, if if even that. Um, 
what I would suggest doing though is have it in advance, test it next to your normal scale that you're weighing on a regular basis so that if there's any discrepancy, you can make the difference up whenever you're reporting it because you want to make sure you're as consistent as possible. The worst thing is when I have somebody, they'll go and go, you know, get up, have some coffee, do some different things, and then go down and weigh themselves in the scale at the hotel or something like that. That's not useful at yeah. data. Um, so, you know, don't do that. <laughs> and if you did, then make sure that you're letting your coach know that's really, really important. As far as really quick on the circumference measurements, the way you can be more accurate is say I'm going to do my thigh as measure up from my kneecap so that I'm getting hitting the same point every time and then going around the circumference of the thigh. Um, so In other words, use a tape measure, come up, I'm going to come up at six, at seven inches to the thickest part of my thigh and I'm going to measure that every time. It, it's, again, it's that consistency aspect that really makes the difference because if we're comparing apples and oranges, then there's no context to that check-in. If we are, and we do see this from week to week is you know, four, three, four inch fluctuations because somebody took a different measurement um, in a different way than they did before. And so usually that requires a little bit of a conversation and clarification for, hey, did you measure at a different spot this week? Um, and there, there was, I remember one athlete per, per particularly that said, oh, well, this has, this week my husband measured me instead of uh, them measuring themselves. And so it produced a different measure. And again, the fact, the point that we want to really emphasize here is the consistency in those body stats. Um, as we talked about the scale I just wanted to go back to that a little bit if your scale is if your primary scale is off um, it, it's it, sometimes it's hard to know unless you have a reference point. Um, a lot of the digital scales now have different ways to calibrate and make sure that they're calibrated correctly, but there's still value in the scale, even if it's off. So say it's a, it's a half pound off, but using the same scale every time gives you that reference point and then the deviations from that reference point. So uh, it's not the, it's not the end of the world if your scale's off because it's the DV it's the changes from whatever that weight is that, that we are looking at as the data point. Right. It's just changing from yeah. one scale to another. That, right, that that's, where, it, that's right? where we get in the, in the difficulty. Correct. One of the things you just said just uh, spurred me to have to make this one other point about the pictures. When you said the husband's doing the, a lot of times, um, you know, we'll, I'll have an athlete send in a check-in and they had their husband take their photos that day and then the husband's tall. So then the angle of the pictures is not good. So just thinking about when you're on stage, the judges are looking up at you. So ideally you want to think about that angle. So usually you're going to put it at maybe knee height uh, the phone um, where you're assuming you're taking your pictures with the phone, which is most of us these days. Um, so, so putting the height. As opposed to a Polaroid? Right. Or, <laughs> <laughs> well, or a camera, know, an actual I'm, camera. I'm, I'm messing um, with you. But anyway, so around knee height is usually, but the, the key again is just the same spot every day. So, you know, I, it, I've had people say, oh, I couldn't take my pictures. My husband wasn't there to take them. Well, in reality, you shouldn't need your husband to take the pictures because you can set a timer on your phone or do uh, a video and screenshot, that kind of thing. Um, so I just want to bring that I, up. And I do think we should talk just a second more about the photos because the selfie camera is not as good as the back facing oh, camera. Oh, good, good point. So, um, and this is something we get into all the time. But before you take your picture, please wipe off the lenses because um, we see that haze over some of the lenses from time to time. Just take a second to wipe off the lenses and use the back facing camera. And if you're saying, well, I can't line myself up in frame. Yes, you can. Um, whether you put something on the floor, you just go back and look, put, place something on the floor and, and take that picture. The picture works better than the screen grab if you're taking a video. I know a lot of people like to take a video of them of themselves posing and then pull this pull the screenshots out of there they are just not as good a quality and and again they work they are just as we are describing this we are telling you what is optimal and what we prefer and what makes the most for your check-in the check-in is about you Okay, uh, the check-in is about you. So make it about you and taking a minute just to get that picture. Um, we have some athletes who put a piece of tape on the floor to get themselves lined up in frame. Um, if you take a good high quality image with the back facing camera and it's a little bit, has a little bit of dead space in it, you can crop it down to get that detail. Um, but ideally, if you set the camera up correctly, just put a little piece of tape in, um, stand in it, take a test shot, you'll know where you I need to move closer, further, right, left, whatever that case is to get that right shot. But once you do it once or twice, then you'll know what that spot is. And again, as Jamie saw, talked about, doing the picture in the same location is also very helpful. Right. And we keep going back to the photos just because without good photos, like the rest of it's for naught. Um, so a, a good, accurate representation of what you actually look like and consistency from one week to the next so that then we're able to compare the progress. Um, but We'll move on to the next piece, which is the biofeedback. So this is where you're going to be collecting all the information 
um, from every aspect of what went on during that week. And that that's that's all. I mean, everybody has we we get. Well, let's talk about what we don't like in this. Okay, the the first thing that we don't like is one word responses or a number. Good, okay? great, good, yes, great. no, <laughs> that, one that out of five, nothing, okay? three out of six, yeah. whatever. Th- yeah. That that doesn't really tell us anything because everybody's five scale or ten scale is something different. So if you're saying, you know, how did you? And and in truth, in some of our feedback templates, we do have a rate yourself on your adherence to your nutrition, for example. Um, and some people will say ten out of ten, and I, I'm good with that. Um, but I also would like some context to that ten out of ten. So so we know t- on, on, on macros for hitting your adherence to your food, 10 out of 10 is pretty self-descriptive because macros is an objective measure um, that has a number associated with it. So we can determine. But I would say the more context you can provide with words, just spell it out. Tell us what's going on. This also applies to people who wear aura rings or other uh, biometric devices that uh, biomedical biometric devices that measure um, body functions, whether it's you know pulse, sleep, et, et cetera. Um, I had one athlete who would say, according to my aura ring, I was a nine. Well, I'm glad that that's what your aura ring says um, relative to sleep, right? Um, but what I really wanted was, how do you feel? Your aura ring may tell you you're at a 10, but you may feel like crap um, when you wake up. So tell me that context. The, the data from a device like that is just that. It's just like the weight. It's a data point. Without the context of that data point, I mean, how many times, Jamie, have you had a client who weighed in and they, they were unhappy with the scale, but then they also report in their biofeedback that they're, they're their cycle is approaching. Well, that's the context that tells you why the scale changed that week. So that's the importance and the interplay of all of this in giving us a 360 view of you. Right. And I like to have both. So, you know, I mean, I think another example of that would be somebody giving us an in-body. So that would be like the... Um, the scales that are DEXA scan or something. Oh, oh, I see what you're the impedance, impedance, electrical uh, impedance. Yeah. Um, and DEXA would be another example, or um, the the bod pod, or um, the the caliper method. I mean, there's all these methods for measuring body fat. They all have. Um, they all have limitations. Margins of errors. Correct. Yes. So it's one of those things where sure, give me the data. <laughs> You know, and I, and I'll take it into consideration, but at the end of the day, I'm going to go off of what you look like and, you know, the progress and, and all the other information. So um, jumping into some of the things that we look for in biofeedback, um, number one, usually we'll ask people how hungry they are. Um, and there's a reason that we're asking this, you know, one, we're gauging, you know, where you know, people's metabolisms are, um, where they are in terms of their tolerance for the level of dieting that we're at. Do they need a diet break? Are they okay? Um, you know, also, you know, something you had mentioned, you know, if they're getting ready to start their menstrual cycle and then they report they're hungry. Okay. you know, all these things are tying together. So we're, we're taking into account all the, all the pieces of information. And then that's helping us, you know, if we're doing a cut and somebody says, I'm so hungry, I barely made it through this week. Well, then we're not going to probably bring food down, you know, we may do a diet break, we may do a refeed, or if we don't have time to do that based on, you know, what we've, our, our time frame for a show or whatever the goal is, um, then we might bring up cardio. So, you know, it helps us know which levers to pull. So that's, that's one data point, um, hunger. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I was just fixated back on the, on the body fat measurements because and I think I've told you the story before about in the Army, um, we used a tape test and guys would literally tra- train their neck because the neck was what was measured for guys. And so guys would do neck exercises to get their neck measurement thicker so that they could, uh, it would show less body fat on the, on the tape. And the reason I tell that story is because these, these in-body scans, DEXA scans, the tape method, the caliper method, they all have value, but they are not the end all and tell all. And so getting the rest of that context for the feedback is really important. Hunger, I find to be something that is very important to, to look at just to, to figure out whether the hunger cues are, are signaling. And, and is this, you know, how do we then, how do we look at that relative to the food? Is if somebody reports really high hunger and they have hit all of their macros and their weight has gone up a significant amount, sometimes that begs the question of, did you really stick to your macros this week? And so that may be something that I'm looking for is maybe you were hungry and maybe you ate off plan, which is fine, but you need to report that. 
Right. So let's jump into the next aspects. I want to make sure we hit on all these biometric um, pieces of feedback. Sleep. Um, sleep is so crucial for recovery. I will tell you straight up. I tell people if it's a matter of missing a workout or getting enough sleep in, I'm going to tell you to get enough sleep. 100%. So, I mean, you keep tearing down, tearing down, tearing down. Eventually, your body's just going to get behind. Um, so it's really important to get enough sleep. Um, if people aren't getting enough sleep, the other thing we expect is usually they're holding a little more water. Sometimes there's a weight spike, that kind of thing. So we need to take that into account because a couple of nights sleep and that weight might come right back down. So we don't want to have a knee jerk reaction to um, the weigh in or, you know, what we're seeing maybe in the, the photos, if they're holding a when little bit of water. When there is disruptive sleep, right? Correct. So, so that is one of those aspects that's really, really important. I, I think of, of uh, hub and spoke sleep is really at the hub at the center of that and then the spokes the hunger the i, I you could arguably put digestion in there as well but i well, think that was digestion, the next one we were going to yeah. go over so put it in there <laughs> so so digestion probably has a little bit of role in that hub but it also is one of the spokes as well because if your sleep is off your digestion can be off as well and by digestion let's 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 be we're talking about poo okay we're talking about the ability to eliminate um consistently uh regularly every day at least once a day um, sometimes twice a day if you're really regular. Um, but we're, that's what, as we think about digestion, menstrual cycle can affect that. Sleep can affect that. Um, somebody desiring to get more fiber intake uh, that up their fiber too much in that one in that week interval um, that can affect digestion. Um, the body takes a little bit of time to to adapt to higher fiber loads, and if you go from ten grams to thirty grams uh, in every day for the next week, um, there's a potential you could have some disruption in your digestion because your body is not used to processing that amount of fiber. Right, and my advice for athletes when you're tracking digestion, um, what, what, what Greg said was, is, is accurate. You know, we want to know, are you eliminating fully? Is there bloating? Is there gas? Is there, you know, diarrhea, things like that? All the fun things. Everybody's like, oh, I hate to overshare, <laughs> but I mean, we need to know these things. Um, in addition to that, like just noticing how different foods make you feel. So if you have a meal and you're consistently noticing, let's say you eat sweet potatoes and every time you eat sweet potatoes, you notice that you're, you're having some discomfort, some bloating, that kind of thing. Those are great things to take note of and then report in on because, you know, it might not be so bad that you want to cut that food completely, or it might be so bad that you want to cut the food completely. Um, but you definitely won't want to eat that particular food during peak week. Um, broccoli is one of those that's so healthy, you know, and some people do well with broccoli. Some people don't do well with broccoli. It's a cruciferous vegetable. Those can cause some bloating. And But for some people, it doesn't at all. So, you know, kind of just paying attention to what foods, you know, feel really good, digest really well, um, maybe provide a little more satiation or or don't provide too much satiation because once we start carving up, sometimes we, we don't want to feel that too full. Um, so really just paying attention and reporting just the things that you're noticing so that your coach is able to then modify things for you and, and, and you know, Bring out the best. I, I want to. I want to hit on that point just a little harder because I do think paying attention, journaling relative to your digestion is so important. Um, uh, during improvement season in particular, it's really good to experiment with different foods to find out what works better with your body, um, and also being aware of how specific foods affect your body is just such a crucial aspect of, of success um, because it definitely shows up in a prep if you know what foods work with you and what foods don't work work well with you. Um, I, I think about this when we were raw foodists and we were talking about uh, milk uh, or, or dairy intolerances that most people are blind to or just don't pay attention to because they don't know, notice mucus buildup or or that little bit of gassiness that occurs after, after consuming dairy. And and, and it really got us to really be sensitive, a little bit more sensitive or a lot more sensitive to the fact of how is my body reacting to this meal? Um, and a lot of times if you're eating complex meals, it may be hard for you to, by complex, I mean a lot of things in that in that particular meal. It may be hard for you to differentiate what is causing a reaction, but noting the reaction after a specific meal is so valuable. I cannot emphasize that enough. 
to determine what foods work best with your body. Um, because if you say to me, Greg, is uh, are, is broccoli good? My answer is going to be this. It depends. How does your body how does your body receive and process that? Some people don't process it well, which is what you talked about, and other people process it just fine. So um, that that applies to everything. And pay attention to your reactions because for myself, I have a I have a, glu a gluten intolerance. I do not have gluten or gluten sensitivity. Excuse me. Um, so I, I'm not celiac, um, but but I do have a gluten sensitivity. So if I eat more gluten, I do have a reaction. And I didn't become aware of that until I took a GI map testing. But then as I did, and it came up positive on my test, I started paying attention more to my reaction, my body reaction after I consumed some of those food items. And sure enough, and I did notice that more. So um, being very aware of how your body is responding to food is a really important part of your feedback. Yeah. And I know we'll do probably more than one episode on digestion because I know that's a, it's a, it's a thing a lot of people deal with. And so just kind of being bringing this awareness in. And then if you are consistently having an issue at that point, doing some GI mapping, maybe doing an elimination type of diet where you are simplifying things to help nail down, you know, what it is. I mean, there are certain allergy tests and things like that. They're not super accurate because, you know, it, it just, you know, there's intolerances, there's allergies, you know, how, how long it's been since you've had that particular item before you get the test. I mean, there's a lot of variables and there's tools out there. So if, if it's something that's kind of constantly going on, then there are ways to go, but it starts by first recognizing that there's an issue. Right. Um, so so digestion is important. And as we say this, we're not advocating, oh, I had a reaction to this meal. I'm going to eliminate that meal. That's not what we're saying at all. We're saying pay attention to the reaction. And then to, one time does not make a trend. <laughs> one time can be a one-off. And maybe there was this, a different seasoning or whatever. There, there can be so many different variables. It could just be stress. It could be stress. I mean, we, we've seen this a lot where people think they have gut issues. And in reality, when once you start to kind of break it down and yep. you know they get tested and everything else, maybe it really wasn't the gut issue. It was just so much stress. And I've been in certain times in my life where things have been really stressful and eating, you know, I just be had food aversions, having a hard time eating, you know. Know, sometimes it can go one way or the other. So it's just important to look at everything in context. It's all about paying attention, you know, notating things, providing data. And that's why in the, these check-ins, this is your opportunity to check in with yourself. And so that's why, you know, we don't want to just go, okay, here's how I look. Well, yeah, we need to know more than that. Like, what are you experiencing on a daily basis? Because there might be something we want to address, run some lab work or something else. Right. And, and that's a great segue to the next point, which is mindset, I think. Um, but before we jump to mindset, I do want to kind of build on that last little point that you talked about, which is this whole concept of TMI, too much information in a check-in. And that that's not how we think. I mean, we don't think that at all. Um, the more you give us, I mean, you don't go to a doctor with arm pain and say, and the doctor says, hey, how are you feeling today? And you say, fine. If you don't report the arm pain to the doctor, the doctor's not going to be able to address that, that issue. Um, and that's true of everything in life. I mean, you don't go to a restaurant and the waitress or waiter comes up to you and says, hey, what do you want? You say, you pick it, you know, I mean, you can do that, but you need to express what you want. And part of that same thing is applies to feedback here is in the biofeedback is there is no such thing as TMI. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So, so, let's so then let's talk mental. about mindset. Yeah. Or mental. Right. So, I mean, that's really, you know, kind of ties into what I was just saying about, you know, if, if you're really stressed, stressed out, it could affect the gut. It could affect your sleep. Um, it, you know, cortisol levels can make you hold on to water. So it's really important to let your coach know and to be honest with yourself, you know, has this been a stressful week? Have I been struggling? Or maybe I feel great. I'm motivated. I'm excited. My workouts were amazing. Like all the mental, the mental feeds into all of these things. So it's just really important to acknowledge from week to week what's going on. Right. And, and we will see those things line up. Um, whether it's uh, if we have a person who has a death in the family, for example, um, we it's not unusual to see sleep disruption. It's not unusual to be, see digestive disruption. Um, and then obviously the mental state, which is where it would normally be reported is that, hey, you know, this week was really sucked for me because we had a death in the family or whatever. Um, that that will then line up and provide that contextual picture. It's it's almost like putting together a puzzle of your of your week is what we're wanting to do is piece together the different pieces so that we are getting a clear picture of, okay, this is what happened to you this week and it is aligning to your feedback or it's not aligning to your feedback. So we're missing something. Um, and, and that does happen from time to time. Right. So again, it's, you know, I, one of the things, especially on this mental side of things, I suggest is, you know, have a note area in your phone. So as you think of things throughout the week, 
make yourself notes so you don't wait till your check-in day and then you're thinking, hmm, well, I can't remember. I think Tuesday something. You know, instead, just keep your notes as you go along, whether it be a question you want to ask or, you know, some information you think would be valuable. Just kind of you know, take those notes as you go through the week. And that way, once you send over your check-in message, half of it's done. Right. Yeah. I think that, I think that's super important. I, we're, we're big advocates of journaling to just kind of keep track. And now, I mean, I think there's a new app on the phone, on the iPhone, at least, um, and in the latest iOS version that allows you to journal di digitally. So you can voice record and, and do your, your journal that way. So journaling has become so much more available and accessible. And really it's just a, a, a kind of a, um, a notation for yourself to remind you, because we are just, in, in case the memo hasn't gotten to you, humans are poor historians. Um, and so what we remember about what happened on the day before, uh, it go, every hour that we get away from that, it becomes a different story. Um, so if you take the time to record what happened in that hour that you want to capture, what you were feeling, what you were experiencing, what happened to you, um, for context, that really helps. It helps you understand you, and it definitely helps your coach understand your 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 context of your week. I agree. And let's jump over to hormones because okay. I think you mentioned this earlier. Um, you know, whether you be male or female, you want to report in. You know, if there's anything that's going on there that you're aware of. Certainly for females, you know, when when our menstrual cycles are starting, maybe if we're starting to. Exp um, to notice some PMS symptoms, you know, um, bloating, uh, breast tenderness, um, holding water, moodiness, all of these things. And those things can also apply to ovulation. Um, absolutely. And then, you know, if somebody's taking birth control or any kind of HRT or any supplements in general, you want to make sure that you're letting your coach know if any of those things change. Um, because all of those things can affect the physique, they can affect your weigh-in, they can affect you know, everything. So um, that's always a tough one when people, oh, I forgot to tell you two months ago, right. I added some birth control and well, we haven't been dropping for two months. So that might be the, you know, be the culprit. So, um, so just really making sure, and this is again, where that journaling is really helpful and having a list of everything so that if something changes, you're immediately, you know, making a note of it. So you don't forget to report in on it. I think it's a good idea in your check-in to include the entire list of any supplements, medications, um, any of those kinds of things that you're taking, just so that if something changes or updates, you make sure that you're also updating that list. Maybe you ran out of something, you know, and so you didn't. Yeah, I, I, I will tell you that I have insisted on that so much more of late. Um, part of the reason is because, and it's, it's always amazing to me that, um, you know, please list your current supplements. And some people give you a very detailed list. Some people give you a, a less than a detailed list. And then uh, they don't put it week to week. And that really frustrates me because I want to know, are there any changes in that supplement list? Um, for example, somebody added uh, creatine in one week and didn't say it. And then three weeks later it comes out, oh yeah, I added the creatine in three weeks ago. Um, and, and just having that awareness of what you are taking and what is going into your body. I mean, that's really just follows the same philosophy of tracking everything that goes in your mouth for my fitness pal. And, and that's the best way to track it and then report it to your coach so that you guys are on the same page because different supplements will affect different things. Right. And even if you're changing the brand right. of supplement, because it might have more sodium in it, you know, so um, that is, you know, sodium is one of those things that we track. So it is a good idea if you've got something that's either got macros or sodium to, to go ahead and put it in your food tracker, just so you make sure that, you know, the consistency is there and there's awareness because say you were taking a BCAA, which, you know, we use less of them now than we used to kind of knowing if you're getting enough protein, you don't necessarily need it. Um, and yet some people like the flavor and they just, you know, or right. if they're vegan and they want to use it. Um, but, you know, you might have, let's say one that has no sodium and then another that's got three to 500 milligrams. Well, that's going to make a difference. So, yeah. you know, all of the details, like if with, to me, if you're checking in with me, when in doubt, give me the information. Right. If it's something I don't need, I'll let you know, but I'd rather you give me too much than too little. I, I think that's the the rule of gunfights, right? It's better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. And so that context really does matter. And the thing that you may think is not a contextual item may be the thing that's 
pre- this affecting your check-ins that mm-hmm. week. Um, if you're using uh, three scoops of a of a pre-workout or a BCAA substance that has 500 milligrams of sodium in it, and that's 1,500 milligrams through the day um, that you're not logging, um, that's that, a lot. That that every day that that adds up to a lot of difference. Um, if you're using those little creamer packets and you're not logging them, um, those those little creamer packets add up. Uh, and so again, it's the importance of of having that awareness. And listen, I, I think you know if I was listening to this and I was not a, a competitor or was thinking about doing it, I, there's a part of me that thinks, oh my God, this is a lot. I, I don't know how I can manage all that. I don't know how I can track all that. I don't know how I can provide all that feedback. And the, I, well, I, what's your answer to that? I'll tell well, I'll tell you mine, but I'd like to know. Well, what this yours. is one of the reasons I suggested like track, you know, kind of taking notes throughout the week so it doesn't feel overwhelming. Um, one of the other things I tell people, especially if they're super busy on check-in morning, they don't have a lot of time to to write up their message the night before, and then they can just send it in the morning. I mean, you make time for the things that are important for right. you, to you at the end of the day. So figuring out what's going to work for you and your schedule so it doesn't become overwhelming or you don't short. Um, the the response, you know, I think is the best way to this go. This is a process. Right. This is a process. And just like when you go to the gym, the first time you do a bench press, you're not going to be proficient at the bench press. You're, it's going to take a few times to get that. So if what we're talking about in these check-ins seems overwhelming, it, it, it's only because we're talking about it in a little bit of a vacuum, like, you know, the, the 10,000 foot view. Once you start doing it day in, day out, this becomes very much part of your practice, part of your habits, part of your process. And the beauty of the feedback is not just in what you're relaying in the feedback, but also in that mental cue for you of what am I paying attention to? And this reinforces the point you made, Jamie, which I do love, which is paying attention throughout the week, is that when you are aware, when you are present in your day, when you are present in your workouts, when you're present in your food prep, that is the best recipe, the best practice and the best recipe for success. Because that awareness will allow you to then recognize deviations from that. It allows you to have to, to be secure in the process and the approach that you're making to some things. And it and it will streamline how this goes. The first time you do it, yeah, it's gonna be a little bit more time consuming. The second time you do it, a little less time consuming, and so on and so on. You build that proficiency through the, through the routine practice. I agree. And jumping over to diversions, that's one of the most important ones. Um, and again, this is another one of those areas where there's no such thing as too much information. Um, so let's kind of start delving into it from a training perspective. Um, you know, I would say underneath this, you know, would be if you missed any workouts, if you ended up having to cut something short, um, if you did extra that is a diversion. Um, uh, that also applies to steps, cardio. Um, if you missed your stretching, your vacuum training, um, if you did extra of any of those things. So to me, I want to know specifically what happened this week. So again, kind of taking notes, making sure you're tracking things. Um, this isn't a judgment. It's just that, you know, if you did, let's say, your step goal is 10,000 steps and you ended up, you know, going on a bunch of hikes and you did 20 plus thousand steps several days. Well, that's really going to affect the total calorie burn for the week. If I don't know about that, I'm going to be making adjustments, assuming that you did what I had asked you to do, not that you did so much more. So the adjustments aren't going to apply properly to the next week when maybe you're not doing the hiking. So again, this is where be by disclosing all this information, you're giving your coach what they need to really be effective for you. And I would say this in in terms of diversions is that we, as a philosophy, we really advocate the life and lifestyle. You you need to be able to live your life. Um, you need to be able to go in that on that hike, even though your step goal is ten thousand steps, and you know that hey, I'm going to go on the steps. I'm going to get twenty eight thousand steps. Okay, you you need to be able to do that, depending on where you are in your in your on your journey and on your roadmap. I mean, if you're if you're in your final week of uh, before show in your peak week, that 28,000 step to 10,000 step differential, probably not advisable. That's probably not the time. Not time advisable. For that. Not, not probably not, not advisable. Not advisable. <laughs> yes. But, but during that other period of time, when you do, we want you to live your life. That is very important. That ties in with the mental state that we talked about before. So diversions are not a bad thing. They are just something to include in your explanation so that we have, again, 
all the puzzle pieces. I mean, it, it, I, I would tell you this. Um, I made the metaphor of 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 a uh, or the the simile of of a of a puzzle and building that puzzle in your feedback to put all the pieces together to get a clear picture. Well, if you're leaving puzzle pieces out of that puzzle box, there's nothing more infuriating than to pop out that puzzle box and and to be missing a few pieces. Um, you're just not going to get as clear a picture. It won't be complete. Right. I love the puzzle analogy because that is right. I mean, if we only have pieces, we may not know what the whole thing is supposed to look like. So um, so that's really important. And then jumping over to the nutrition piece when it comes to diversions. I mean, I have some people that are so detailed that they'll let me know, hey, I had some a couple pieces of gum and sodas that I didn't log. I mean, to me, like that level of detail when it comes to it is really helpful. Now, listen, again, if you're, if you're like you said, if you're, if this is a lifestyle thing for you, you may not need to go to that that level of detail. It really depends on what outcomes you want and how much control is needed in those outcomes. So I know like if you're a lifestyle person, some people won't track their veggies, for example, which might be perfectly fine for a lifestyle person. But when we're talking about a competitor, we need that in both because they're not calorie free, first of all, but also we need to know how much fiber we're getting in and things like that. So um, so there are those other aspects. And the, and the one thing I just wanted to I, I expand on that one little piece. Is it no? If you're a lifestyle person, you may not need to. You know, the, some of these things don't matter as much. But but there's a do. But they kind of do matter. And and here's the point or the argument that I would make for wh- why it matters is that part of building this lifestyle is the awareness that comes with it in food tracking. For I'm just I'm specific to food tracking. And and I would say the same for uh, having a workout diary as well. Is is having that historical reference of what you did, um, knowing what is going in your mouth and knowing how it affects your outcome for the week is power. And and I don't know any person who doesn't want to have power. You get that power through the awareness and through the adherence to your plan. So tracking everything gives you power. And it gives you that power of awareness and understanding of, okay, when I do this, this is what it does. When I have this much, uh, you know, I, I deviated by 10 grams of carbs and that made no difference at all, but I devi- deviated by 10 grams of carbs every day and that showed up in my check-in. Uh, well, I mean, I'm going to disagree a little bit okay. in here I like in that, that. In that um, when it comes to somebody who's who's got lifestyle goals, it's really going to depend on what those goals are and where they are Fair. mentally because, you know, as coaches, I feel like it's important to meet people where they're at. So if you've got somebody who's brand new lifestyle client, they've never tracked before, um, at that point, we might start intuitive. And then from there, maybe we build up to just tracking calories. So just kind of putting things in, not even worrying about the macronutrients. From there, we might bring in a, a protein goal. So they start becoming aware of how much protein they're getting in. You know what I mean? We, you know, I think it's important, you know, when you're just getting started, not to overload because for some people, just even tracking is, is so overwhelming. It's so daunting. So again, like I think, you know, it's hard to not, it's important to not have hard, fast rules, but when we're talking specifically about somebody who wants to compete and they're, you know, they're in, you know, competition prep, or even in their improvement season where they're really wanting to control the variables to make sure they're getting the most out of that period of time, that's where, you know, I want to really encourage people to be very detailed. Um, You know, somebody had asked me just recently that's going to be competing, do I need a food scale? Uh, Yeah, you you need a food scale for sure. Like you need to be very specific. We have to control variables. We're on the razor's edge when we're on stage. So any little thing could throw us off, a difference in sodium, a difference in food. Like all of these things really, really matter. So this is really where for me, this diversion section is so important. So the more information you give, the better. Depending on where you are in your journey, your coach may want different, you know, types of information or pieces of information. I, I do think it's important to not overwhelm somebody who's new or who's really more on the lifestyle track, um, you know, and, and it really helps to start there before you consider competing so that once you do go to that next level of competing, it's it's not as big of a leap up from, you know, not doing any of these things to doing all of these things. But again, kind of coming back to the diversion section on your check-in, the more detailed you are, the better. The more accurate you are in your depiction, the better. I mean, I had one client who, you know, she was like popping a raisin in her mouth when she was you know, doing her kid's raisin brand or licking the spoon when she was doing their PB&Js, like things like she just wasn't tracking. We weren't getting the movement until I, we kind of realized this was going on and had her stop doing it. So, you know, paying attention to if it's not logged in, if you're in prep, it shouldn't go in your mouth unless it's logged in, you know, weighed, measured, logged. 
I, I, I love that. And I do, I, I see your point and I do agree with you that meeting people where they are. And I think that, it, that it, 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 my point really was more that this is a process. It's a process you get better at as you do. Um, just to, I guess, uh, assure people that, that this is not as daunting as what it seems when, when we first talk, talk about it. No, you think it is daunting? Okay. I do think it's daunting for people when they first get started. Fair. That's fair. I, I, just, I just want That's to be fair. real. I mean, I yeah. think I think it's one of those things where we have been doing this for so That's long fair. and we do it every single day. So what has become, you know, second nature in a lot of cases to us and a lot of the athletes that we're working with because they're, you know, they've also been doing this for quite a while, you know, kind of delving back into like just getting your toe in the water, just getting started. And I just know how daunting, like for some people, you know, even doing a check-in once a week could be daunting for them. You know, taking pictures of themselves could be daunting for them. You know, their first time tracking. I mean, when I'm walking somebody through for the first time building a day, sometimes I can be a little overwhelming for them, okay. you know? So it's, it's you know, I, I teach people a KISS principle. Keep it simple. You know, um, create a day and repeat it and then swap out as you need to. Um, but again, like the more advanced you get, the longer you're doing this. Yes, of course, it becomes second nature. And everyone, you know, like that we're around for, for a large part that have been doing this for a long time, they'll go to a restaurant and they can look at the menu and immediately know what they can easily track and how to order and things like that. But these are skills that are developed over time. That's fair. That, that, that's fair. All right. So let's wrap this up, I think. Or, and I know there's so much more that goes into a feedback uh, in, the, in the biofeedback in, in terms of you know, right, we, we hit like. the main points yeah. and there's more. We, we want water consumption. We want uh, exertion, perceived exertion and workouts. We want um, what was your biggest win for this week? What was your biggest learning for this week? Uh, there's a whole bunch of feedback items that are included that I would call ancillary items, but but important nonetheless for, for gauging how that week went. But the primary things that, that we covered, hunger, sleep, digestion, hormones, diversions, mental state, um, I think those are, are those are the primary ones. That Strength. I missed. And strength. Talk about strength for a second, because I don't think we talked about that. Right. And energy, I, I, strength and energy. Yeah, right? strength and energy. Those are the other two that we just didn't touch on. You know, um, you know that those things that go up and down. You know, and and they're related to everything. So if you got less sleep this week, you might not have felt as strong or had as much energy in the gym. Maybe it's because of a menstrual cycle, um, or maybe you just felt beast mode, like you couldn't believe how strong you were. You're able to push more weight. So those things are going to ebb and flow. It's not a perfect linear sort of progression when it comes to strength and energy. So letting your coach know um, what did that look like for you this week and what were you able to accomplish and strength and energy become very important as we consider when to when to program in a deload week if somebody's energy is, is declining or if you are just exhausted and are unable to recover that's where energy becomes really important and the other contextual piece I would put on strength is um, I had some people have a narrow view of strength in terms of thinking that it, it's just about how much weight they are pushing which certainly is a component of strength strength, but um, our, me, meaning I didn't, I have some people say my strength was bad this week because I didn't get any PRs. Um, well, there's other ways to measure your strength. Were you getting intense workouts? Was the intensity there, regardless of whether the weight was there? Was the connection there, um, mind-muscle connection? There are different ways of measuring that strength. And so when we are looking at strength, it's not just about the amount of weight you're pushing and not getting PRs in a week. Well, again, I think we've said this before, but um, nobody will ever ask you for a PR when you walk on stage. Stage. So uh, the amount of weight is less relevant than is your your strength and intensity. Meaning, were you able to push through your workouts? Were you connected? Were you intense? I mean, do you have a different way of looking at it? No, I think that's okay. perfect. And the other thing I was just going to add to that too is if you know if you noticed any like little um, tweaks or or little you know aggravations to certain area, if you feel like you pulled something, if you you know those things are really important to you Absolutely. know, and and also you know anything else that's going on, if you you know if you're feeling under the weather, you know if you you know th those kinds of things, you know what is your what's your state of well being and um, you know both physically and and from a from a wellness standpoint. Absolutely. And and I and I I'm glad you mentioned that because injuries are something that a lot of people want to tend to push through. Um and that is a mistake. Um pushing through an injury. Uh and first of all, get check get I my first thing is if when you get injured, go to your doctor, get checked out, make sure there's nothing nothing there. Um if they're if they're if you're cleared by the doctor, then the next part is just listen to your body and honor that message. If you're feeling it 
pushing through that pain can often aggravate it or push it to a different injury. So um, that that's really important. Right. So a lot we covered. Yeah. Um, just and I feel like we just kind of cut touched the iceberg on that. But there's a lot that goes into a good feedback. Yeah. So I think we're ready to sign off and yes. wish everybody the three Bs. Be good to yourself. Be good to each other. And be safe. And like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. And let us know your feedback in all ways because we do pay attention to that and we are here for you. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to Fit Body Lifestyle. We hope today's episode has left you feeling motivated and equipped to tackle your fitness goals, business challenges, and the daily dance of life. Remember to value progress over perfection. Life's tough enough alone. Find the chosen family around you to help you along the way. If you enjoyed today's episode, we'd really appreciate it if you would subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite streaming platform. And don't forget to follow us on Instagram at FitBodyFusion.